In October 1977, the Alberta government announced the creation of Kananaskis Country. This 4,000 square kilometer, multi-use, four-season recreational area would include three provincial parks and some of Canada's most rugged and spectacular terrain. It would be developed to cater to outdoor adventure-seeking enthusiasts. In Kananaskis, however, especially with extreme sports, adventure can turn to disaster without warning. The Alberta government quickly realized that the area needed a provincially run public safety program. The man selected to shoulder this and many other responsibilities at Kananaskis for the next 18 years was Lloyd Kiwi Gallagher. Lloyd Gallagher was born in Levin, New Zealand in 1939. His father, Robert, an avid outdoorsman, brought Lloyd with him on hunting trips from an early age. It was from him that Lloyd developed his deep love and respect for the wild. I think my blessing was my parents, my father especially, um, carried me in my pack, took me up in the mountains as a little boy. I didn't realize in those days, because it was a big family of six other brothers, that we had to go and he had to shoot some red deer or wild pig and he needed it to feed the family. And then later on, my uncle got me interested in a sort of a tramping outdoor mountaineering club. Um, and by 16, I was already leading trips of two weeks into the backcountry mountaineering, not only hiking, but actually ropes and knots and all that. So by 16, I was pretty keen on the, on the whole process. Even then, he was involved in search and rescue. If you belong to a, a club back home and you're selling, everybody's involved with search and rescue. It's just part of being belong to a club. So I ended up going out on a lot of searches and minor rescues because of my training, um, not realizing later on it would become a full-time job for 20 years. At the age of 21, Lloyd, after apprenticing as a mechanic, headed to the South Island of New Zealand to live the life he had always dreamed of, exploring the wilderness, working when he had to on the Milford track and living off the land. I love, I love, I love the outdoors, I love people, and I love people, and I think uh, that is a big bearing on, on my lifestyle as well. During that time, David Fulford, a close friend and experienced mountaineer, was killed in a climbing accident. It was Lloyd who broke the news to Fulford's mother. The experience gave him insight into how to provide comfort to grief-stricken parents and loved ones. It also provided him with a mental attitude toward the victim that he believes is fundamental for anyone involved in rescue activities. He slipped down this mountain, disappeared, and um, we couldn't get to him. Um, it just taught me how quick and easy it is to have an accident, and I've always kept that in my back of mind when I've responded. I've never played, tried to play God. I've never tried to say, you shouldn't have done that or gone here. I realized accidents can happen very quickly. It can happen to anyone, anytime. By 1965, Lloyd had earned enough money to do what New Zealanders are renowned for, roam the world. He bought a one-way ticket aboard the ocean liner Arcadia and sailed for Canada. He planned to return to New Zealand within 24 months. He would not be back for 15 years. It was Canada that would give him the nickname Kiwi. Well, I came in, of course, I got off the boat after a month on the boat. Um, I remember a group of friends of ours going to a Chinese restaurant in Vancouver, put all the money that we had left on the table. We had our last meal and we all walked out. Not, none of us had a penny to our name. And I hitched to Lake Louise and um, ended up getting a job actually on the golf course in Banff for my first few months. Lloyd didn't sit still much once he arrived. He secured his mountain guide's license in 1967 and worked as a mountain guide in Western Canada, Alaska, and Greenland. While there, he got a call that would again change the direction of his life. The sport of heli skiing was in its infancy, and Hans Moser was starting up Canadian mountain holidays. He wanted Lloyd to join his team. He basically was in on the start of the, heli, the development of the heli skiing industry in the world. He was one of Hans Moser's right-hand people through all the startup years of the heli ski industry. He was a manager of, of one of the major lodges and, and one of the important guides in, 
in Canadian mountaineering history. To be a mountain guide, number one, uh, you have to take control, you have to be very organized, um, you're dealing with a whole diverse group of people, you do a lot of training, you got to keep the skill level up, and, um, and when you're involved with uh, teaching climbing and helicopter skiing, there's always sort of little mishaps happening along the road that you have to respond to. So looking back on those 15 years of Canadian Mount Holidays, it was tremendous training ground for what happened later with the rescue business. While there, he met a pretty girl from Ontario named Fran Kelly, who was working in Banff. Uh, we hit it off really well, and then I said I'd marry her and take her away from all this um, nonsense. And here we are still doing it 30 years later. And in my case, if it wasn't for my wife, I would never have been able to do what I have done, knowing that I've given her more gray hairs than I've given myself. In addition to his work with CMH, Lloyd was busy with his own mountain climbing adventures. He climbed Mount Europaha, Peru's second highest peak, Mount Logan, Canada's highest peak, and Mount Pumori in Nepal, known as the Daughter of Everest. Climbing with him was a joy, I mean, uh, because I felt that he was, you know, he was a uh, senior to me for 30 seconds and then realized that, that he just wanted to be part of a team, but he had, uh, he had all these special things that he could, he could bring to it. So climbing with him uh, was, was wonderful and I shared some of the high points in my life with him. His reputation was growing. It didn't take long for the Alberta government and Kananaskis to come calling. In 1979, Lloyd became their Alpine specialist. We hired him initially because of his, his background as a guide and his commitment to, uh, to helping people. He had great people skills um, and great technical skills. Lloyd was basically um, starting up a whole new department um, and the people that were brought in were a lot of boys from the, from the prairie provinces that, that got hooked into uh, working for parks in Alberta and they had no idea what a rope was or, well they knew what a rope was but not a climbing rope and all this mountain terrain and getting around in it and that sort of thing. So I think it was a great challenge for Lloyd, but a very enjoyable one. For the next 18 years, Lloyd put his energy into building the public safety program. His first priority was to get the rangers on staff trained. It used to take me five years to bring a ranger up to what I call a good basic level so they could become a rescue leader. I set up a program where we, they would have to go through sort of five different levels of um, what I would call uh, rock climbing mountaineering program. And in the winter, all the winter programs from uh, avalanche work uh, and, and going up the skills so they could ice climb and be very confident in the mountains. And then all the first aid qualifications, we had water rescue. And that's given them training six or seven weeks out of the year full time, plus the weekend stuff. So it shows you how much skills it takes to become quite proficient in the rescue business. These are all things, um, skills and procedures and techniques that Lloyd's shown us over the past oh, 15, 20 years. Basically when I came along I knew nothing about any of this stuff. And now to the point nowadays where I'm doing what he was doing 20 years ago and that's teaching it. His skill as a trainer was legendary. Lloyd in uh, Rogers Pass and where he was uh, running a training session for the Guides Association and, and I remember to this day that I've I learned more about rope handling in a half an hour with Lloyd at that time than I think I've ever learned anything in since. And Lloyd has a really really um, an amazing reputation in the Calgary Fire Department. The guys in the Calgary Fire Department are just are so taken by Lloyd because his because of his outgoing uh, and personality and just his method of teaching. For mountain rescue, Lloyd designed the training to cover three approaches to an emergency scenario. Improvised rope rescue, organized rope rescue, and helicopter sling rescue. Lloyd was very, very easy to work with. Um, very receptive to any ideas you wished you know, if we wanted to put, from the pilot point of view, wanted to put into the training operation. And during the actual rescues, everything was, there were basically were not any surprises. And it's just a tool out of our toolbox. I mean, we have a tendency to think this helicopter can solve all our problems. Well, we train, we train 
that we don't have it. And when we do have it, it makes life a lot easier. It's more cost efficient, less people are exposed to the dangers. Um, and usually if we're lucky, a major climbing rescue, if we can get on scene, within an hour and a half, we can wrap it up. But if I have to take manpower to climb up there, wrap up, get to the person, package him, transport him out, it's 12 to 15 people minimum, plus I expose a lot of people to a danger, and it costs a lot more because of manpower. So the helicopter is a very efficient tool if, if we're lucky enough to use it, but we train as if we don't have it. Lloyd was obsessed with planning. In addition to training his people for every situation, he developed standard procedures and strategies to be followed when teams are called out for a rescue. Just like any project that any one of us work on, there's always, for every hour of, of, of rescue, there's, uh, there's days gone in of getting prepared, waiting for that one hour of rescue. And I've always tried to work on being very practical in my manuals. And I put together a little S a standing operating procedure, a little black book now that's circulating to all the park ranges in Alberta because most of these park rangers really get training because they're in another part of Alberta and some park. And now they could have a rescue, would it be a, a climbing rescue or vehicle accidents or a medical problem or a big um, uh, chemical problem, they've got a little checkoff list to make it safer for them before they respond into the scene. So, yeah, I, I think they're useful. But also a lot of people have helped me put them together. You know? Lloyd was involved on the front lines or as overhead team leader for over 500 rescues. This included everything from simple fractures to motor vehicle accidents to mountain rescue. I know I have helped a lot of people from a lot of misery by responding on the scene quickly and solving the problem. And I've also saved quite a few people's lives over the last 20 years. And that's a tremendous accomplishment. And do I feel good about that? You betcha I feel good about that. He's the kind of person that is completely, completely obsessed with the welfare of everybody else around him. So if he, if he ever rescued you, he might just be calling you up afterwards to see how you're doing. If you broke your bones, to, if he didn't even know you, he'd, 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 he'd be checking up on you afterwards. And then Canon asks us, do we know every year, at the beginning of the year, we're going to have somewhere between 7 and 14 fatalities every year, doesn't matter what we do. And it took me years before I could accept that, that, that each year I was going to have that many fatalities and that many accidents, and it wasn't something I could physically do to, to stop it. It was just nature and people and um, weather, and um, you have to learn to live with that. And, um. One tragedy in 1986 was especially difficult and heartbreaking. A light plane carrying two people went missing. A second plane with three people on board went searching for the first aircraft and also disappeared. The CFCN Evening News with Shelley Fine. Good evening. Bad weather is hampering the search for five men in two light planes missing in Kananaskis country since Friday. The second plane was soon found, but 10 days of searching had yielded no clues on the location of the first. Then, a third aircraft, a Canadian Forces Twin Otter with eight people on board, also crashed. The search would be in its 20th day before all the victims and aircraft would be recovered. There were no survivors. Although Lloyd was the ground search coordinator, he had very little control over air search operations. It took a while before the expertise of the ground people and the, the, the military came to respect each enough well enough that we all worked towards the same goal, which was to find the lost plane. I had brought in um, the army. I had 500 um, army people working, looking at certain areas. I had two or three hundred people searching in different areas. I had all Kinsara, all the plane people out, helicopters out. So it was like a major, uh, <laughs> it was a major search. Out of that tragedy came a new goal for Lloyd, the development of closer interagency cooperation, including presentations by SAR agencies at conferences he organized. He would have an annual critique every year, and, and this critique would, would uh, it, it actually got to be quite a big event where all the different agencies from around the area that would assist us came to this meeting, and, and it, it got to be quite a, a, a grandiose fair for just a one-day one day situation. And the people from Nas National Search and Rescue Secretariat came out to it, and, and in the end, 
when Sarsene first started in Banff, it was sort of modeled after what Lloyd had been putting together for a very number of years in Kananaskis country. Lloyd's responsibilities at Kananaskis continued to grow. In 1988, his position was changed to Emergency Services Coordinator. He was given responsibility for all emergency response resources in the area, including fire and ambulance services. He also coordinated special disaster services planning and preparations for the 1988 Olympics. Although he had extensive mountain experience and expertise in rescue, it was his personality, the way he worked with people, that inspired others. He's a, a wonderful people person and he's a mentor to me in that way because he's always uh, very caring about all the staff and people that work here. The thing about Lloyd is uh, he's the most upbeat person I've ever met. Um, the guy just, uh, he'd never get down. I remember one time there was an accident uh, up by Astor. This fella was missing and uh, I was in a two-man team that found him. This fella had crashed and he was deceased at the base of this cliff. Um, it was really windy so we couldn't get anybody else to help us and uh, we had to package this guy up and send him out. It was, um, it was really hard on us. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a pretty bad one. Anyhow, we met Lloyd uh, back up on the trail afterwards and he uh, sat us down, we had lunch, and by the time we had finished, um, everybody was back upbeat again and ready to go. He just, he has, uh, he's just got the ability to motivate people and uh, make them forget about the bad stuff and focus on what we're here to do, which is to help people. Lloyd never tires of the mountains and the thrill of the climb. In 1982, he was co-leader of the Canadian expedition to Everest. Five years in the planning, Everest would challenge every fiber of his body and spirit. Ultimately, some of the Canadian team reached the summit, but four people lost their lives in the effort. Lloyd's air regulator malfunctioned and froze up. Lloyd was forced to descend from 26,000 feet to 3,000 feet in the dark to reach Camp 3 on the Lhotse face. He never made it to the summit. So Everett was um, a big chunk of my life, getting things organized, and I'm glad I went. I was sorry to, uh, to lose the four people, the Sherpa and the, and the climbers. Um, uh, you realize there are no true vectors on Everest, just survivors. You realize when you've been up there that you're not knocking any mountain off. Uh, if the mountain wants you to climb the mountain, it'll let you. If not, you're out of it. Although Lloyd is optimistic that search and rescue will continue to improve as others move to take his place, he is concerned about the lack of young people coming up through the ranks. We don't see enough young blood coming up through the program, which, which all these rescues, whether it be a volunteer or, or organized, group. Um, we need to keep this expertise and skill that we have around and get it passed on to this next younger generation. Lloyd has won quite a few awards over the years, but attributes the opportunities he has had and his successes to his wife, Fran. But she's always been very supportive. She's always there organized. She's always done stuff. She's helped me on all my pre-planning, all my organizing. Um, She's there when I come back from a major rescue and she knows I'm upset. Someone's died or some young kid. She's there for my support and, um, and she's helped me for all these emergencies and all these rescues. Although Lloyd is supposed to be retired, he's busier than ever. He and Fran now operate their own company, Mountain Trekking and Tours, and provide guiding and heli-skiing adventures. 35 years now of teaching mountain climbing and skiing and also involved in rescue work. So I, I keep pinching myself, think how lucky I am, because most of us go through life um, wanting to do things that we never get the opportunity. And in my case, I felt I've walked on a red carpet ever since I've arrived in Canada. He's a guy who, who never will retire. And nobody would, who knows him would think that he'd ever stop until the legs are knocked right out from underneath him. I enjoy taking people out in the mountains. I enjoy them so they have a good climb. And I love standing on top of a peak. I think it's a gift. and. Uh, and if I don't stand on top of a mountain, oh, it's still, the journey was still worthwhile. So, um, I'm glad that I can still do it. You know, my body's still good, and I've never had an accident, that's good, and I want to keep it there. Lloyd's legacy to uh, search and rescue around here, I guess, would be, uh, would be us and our team. Um, the number of people that we've saved over the years uh, 
you know, it's just countless. And not just people that we've actually rescued, but uh, people that we talk to and give advice to and uh, maybe steer in the right direction. Um, I think uh, countless lives have been saved as a direct result of uh, Lloyd and his work in Kananaskis country. When Lloyd started at Kananaskis in 1979, there were 1.5 million visitors. Today, over 4 million people a year enjoy its facilities. They do so safer because of his dedication to public safety and rescue. The impact Lloyd Kiwi Gallagher had on mountain rescue will resonate for years to come. The pioneering techniques he developed, implemented, and taught are being used by the rangers he trained and passed on to the next generation of rangers. And that's exactly how he planned it.